Hey, buddies, Potato McWhiskey here, and welcome back to the Human Kai tutorial, which is sponsored by Amplitude and Sega. Although theoretically not technically sponsored, they only sponsored the, sponsored the first video. However, I'm giving them the whole series for free because I'm that kind of nice guy. Um, I think there was maybe a hot patch or a hot fix between uh, my last recording session on this current one, or else I just never noticed the fact that I'm losing 35 influence per turn. So that's a bit of a problem that we have to deal with. And there are ways that we can deal with it. For example, we can just straight up opt to liberate one of these cities if we want. Uh, we can turn this into an independent city or outpost and they will like us and we don't have to deal with the consequences of this essentially draining our influence treasury. However, we do also have other options to deal with that. Now, my hope was to pick up leadership here so I could go for a small council and get plus one city cap. However, for whatever reason, I'm now in the negative of influence here and that's going to be a bit of a problem. So I think I'm going to have to rely on technology to get that city cap, which means I'll need to pick up philosophy here, um, which means I'll have to pick up writing as a priority. Um, but yeah, this is, there's so much happening, so much hard to get to. Uh, I need four more districts to achieve my era star thing, two more technology. So we'll be in this era for a little bit longer before we can get that city cap. So we're going to have to deal with some negative influence here. Now, I don't know what happens when your influence goes heavily on the negative, but that's part of the game, right? We'll figure these things out together. Um, that's part of this series. While I am very familiar with the absolute basics of the game and I can explain every decision I'm making and why they're good, well, you know what I could do? I could liberate this city. I could liberate this city, take and then retake it. You know what? Let's let's liberate a card. I know I just spent some time like getting it, but I'm going to liberate a card so that I don't quite take such a huge influence penalty. And then I'll be able to get the plus one city cap from my civics here by uh, triggering leadership and hopefully that works out for me so uh you know you can see how i'm using my understanding of the game's mechanics to make decisions and all i've really done like i i didn't know i was going to do that before i did that all i did was i like assessed what was happening to my empire assessed the sort of realm of possibilities that I could do to respond to it and then decided upon one. And I don't know if what I did was the correct or right choice, but I know what I did addressed the problem and that's a learning experience for me. And so I can carry myself forward here in, into the next, next things and be confident that I have at least learned a mechanic and I might make better decisions in future. The Harappans would like open borders and I believe we said that we would be friendly with the Harappans. I also need to buy more of their resources. In particular, I'm very interested in Ebony. Ebony is a very interesting resource because it essentially gives you plus three production per territory that's attached to a city and production is king and I'm going for a heavy production game. So I'm going to buy both of these Ebonies. Uh, gemstones are also pretty interesting because they give money from your market quarters. Um, but I'm, I'm less enamored with these other resources. I will eventually want to buy them, but I don't need them immediately. Ah, I'm worried about these two archers. So I'm going to grab myself a, uh, a chariot and a markabata. And I might even use gold to try to make that go faster. I might even drop my production. No, that doesn't actually speed it up. Well, I really need to need to get a unit to defeat this. So hopefully maybe I'll get enough gold to deal with that. I could also in theory pull these chariots out and use them for that. If I broke those chariots out of this battle formation and ran them down here, they'd get here pretty quick. So I'm going to pull my chariots out of this northern area and send them down to deal with these archers. You always need to be keeping an eye on stuff like this. A very occasionally, you should just zoom out to about this level, in my opinion. I just kind of have a little look around. See if there's any units or anything that you need to address. Anything important that's kind of like, hmm, that shouldn't be the way that that is. Just keep your eyes peeled for stuff. We're getting organized warfare next turn. So let's merge these armies up together. I have a pretty heavy uh, melee heavy army. I have like this army with two warriors and two chariot archers, this army with two warriors and two chariot archers, and this army with a warrior, an archer, and two spearmen. So I'm, I'm pretty ready to take this on. Now that I have the influence, I will of course come in here and get that plus one city cap. Now the nice thing about this is it'll actually push me towards the plus four influence on emblematic districts, which is fantastic because that's going to massively improve my influence per turn because I have a lot of emblematic districts built, right? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them built, which is a pretty tidy sum. A little bit of snow territory up here in the north and I will want to take those over. So that's something worth considering. Oh man, there are a lot of curiosities over here. Thank you for the other some 
fairly peaceful people living here and uh, they don't seem too aggressive. We got an event and we actually got lucky, uh, which I think means that nothing bad happened for that event that we had about the flood earlier, which is superb. Spending 120 gold to avoid negative consequences is absolutely worth it. We now just unlocked fishing, which gives us access to the harbor. The harbor is a very unique district in that it exploits all resources. Most districts do not do that. However, it only exploits water tile. It does give you extra money if it has market quarters adjacent to it and it acts as a naval unit spawn but you can only build one per territory. We also have access to the fishery which gives you plus three food on your harbors. Reasonably good infrastructure stuff. Plus three food on your harbor is basically like working three more of these coastal tiles. We also got organized warfare finished so we can now use reinforcements in our battles. I'll show you guys that in a moment. We have access to the barracks which makes the units cheaper which does require copper as you can see there on the bottom re re uh, resource prerequisites that requires copper. That is the symbol of copper. You can see that up here. I'm getting three of them from trade and then we also have access to the battering ram and you can see from the sort of um, sketch hash pattern and the shape of the unit that this is a C Siege weapon. It's a special type of unit that can only be built during long maintained sieges of cities. Uh, and because it's a battering ram, the only thing it can do is attack walls. So it's very vulnerable to melee attacks, but it can punch a hole in a wall and make it easier to attack a city. There is the scientist Aristar and the, another merchant Aristar. So our score now is very, very high. The only one I'm missing is building a single district here and maybe getting some kills. And I think I'm going to get those kills right now. And I'm going to have, I, have, I will have made an insane, insane amount of Aristars for this era. Let's begin the battle. If I hover over this, you can see this is going to be the battlescape and I'm okay with that. The enemy is going to have a pair of archers and then get reinforced by a pair of chariots. I'm going to be entering the battle with a bunch of these units plus a bunch of reinforcements. So I'm pretty ready for this. Let's begin the manual battle. You can see two of my or, or several of my armies sort of were laid out in this way because um, the battlescape expanded as my front line and the number of units I had expanded until I could get my entire army in on this. Let's end our deployment as I'm reasonably happy with how the deployment is set up here. We have an archer here. They do have a little bit of fortification. I'm going to sneak around with this spearman. Let's get all of our units into position roughly where we want them to be for attacking. I'll have one guy flank around to see if there's anything behind the city. And now it's just a, a, a matter of getting units into good positions to shoot and fight. So I think I'm going to focus, focus fire on this archer a little bit because he's on the end of the line. If we kill him with a ranged unit, we should be able to step into the city with this spearman and attack this chariot from um, from within the fortifications. You can see here, this, uh, this warrior attacking, he's getting plus six from fortification. But if I step inside, he loses that fortification bonus and these units become evenly matched. That's kind of part of the, the, the things you have to consider is if you can get a unit inside of their walls, now I can attack this unit without suffering the penalties that I normally do from attacking through a wall. Attacking from the high ground into a ranged unit is often a really good idea. And so the, the sort of combat system is, is very robust and, and very, uh, what's the word? Very, there's a word I'm looking for. It's like, there's, there's a lot happening. It's, it's very flexible and there's a lot of mechanics happening, a lot of moving parts, and you have to kind of be aware of it. It's not necessarily complexity, but there's sort of a, yeah, I guess I guess complexity would be would be the word. Although I will say this: typically, you you can win most battles just by having more units than your enemy, um, which is kind of the case here. You, you know, either bring a bigger stick or bring more sticks. Those are your choices usually in this game. And, and honestly, that's true of most sort of 4X strategy games where any sort of fighting will happen. All right, so we increased our city capacity and we just killed a bunch of their units, which got us the militarist star. I need four more kills. Unlikely I'll get those four. Let's have a look here. We could get a non-aggression pact with the Mycenaeans. I'm going to refuse. They want me to sign a military treaty with them. That is their demand because they are aggressive. Now... They're looking for war right now. I'm not looking for war because I'm still dealing with this whole shenanigans over here. So if I can buy just a little bit more time, I'll be very happy. Oh, another peaceful sieve appeared over here. Slightly unfortunate. I never know where to put my outposts in these like snow regions because there's never really good food. But I think I'm just going to plonk it like here. It is 12 production, but it's a little bit of food too. Whereas if I put it here, like focusing on the production aspect, probably my best bet. I don't know where the barbarian archers that were down here went. 
So I'm going to keep searching for them um, using these chariots and also pick up any things I find on the way. All right, my capital needs instructions and I need one more district. So I think I may go for the harbor here. Although that said, I don't know if I really want a harbor that badly. I could go for another production district. I could go for a farm. I am light on food. So maybe a farm is the right move because I'm, I'm, I'm very light on food, actually, if I think about it. So I'll go ahead and throw down a farmer's quarter. All right, we have uh, discovered slavery, essentially, and we can make a decision here. We can either go for criminal slaves, which when we build the commons quarter, which is a district we'll talk about a little bit later, we will be able to get food and industry from those commons quarters. And that's actually important because I think that actually allows the commons quarter to work yields underneath the tile. And then this industry also gets boosted by anything that's good boosted by industry and sort of the food. It's kind of a complex thing to explain, but essentially this is actually worth a lot more than plus one food, plus one production per commons quarter in some cases. And then the plus one population bonus per ransack. I'm actually not sure how this works, but ransacking is when you essentially have a unit stand still and pillage things. And I think what that means is if you if you kill if you ransack a unit, you'll, you'll, or if you ransack something, you'll get a population out of it. So let's go ahead and pick up writing so that we can get the laws and stuff like that going. Very nice. There is the builder star that we were looking for. Now we're ready. We've done all of the things that we thought it would be reasonable to do. And it's around turn 48, which means we're kind of on par. If you imagine that each era of the game should last roughly 50 turns, um, and that's if you combine the Neolithic era and the ancient era together into a single era. Um, about 50 turns feels about right for me. The game will last about 300 turns. Now you can obviously go a little bit faster. You might do 30 turns if you're kind of pushing really hard through the game. I, you know, I, w I wouldn't feel too pressured to go shorter than 50 turns because look at all the score we got. Remember, gold stars are worth a lot more than bronze stars. So rushing your way up through the eras isn't always the best move. Sure enough, you will miss out on some opportunities here. Like maybe I wanted to play the Maya here this game and actually, the Maya would have been amazing for me because remember, I'm playing the Egyptians. So just kind of like we can go through here. I'm playing the Egyptians. I get plus one production on tiles producing industry and my districts are cheaper. So if I had switched to the, the Mayans, I would have got that plus two production per out uh, per worker. And then I would have also got the Kuna, which would have given me faith and production and even more production. So this would have like reinforced my identity and empowered me as a as a strong production sieve. So just just by taking my time and picking up that fame, I, I gave up this opportunity, which is the downside of, of building up that fame. But, you know, more fame is always better. You know, more fame is, 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 is hard to come by, which is why you may actually choose in some cases to transcend your culture. Uh, this will give me an extra 10% fame for everything I achieve in the next era. And there are some times where this might actually be the best choice for you. Let's say you're playing a big game and there's like eight other players and the last pick you have is something you really don't care about. Maybe you just are like, um, I'm just going to stay and be the Egyptians because the extra fame and none of the other saves really appeal to me. We have a bunch of choices and it's hard. Like I would say one of the first things you want to do is kind of choose like, what is our goal for the next era? And the, one of the easiest way to choose that is either like, am I going to be expansionist? Am I going to be going to war? Am I going to be, you know, focusing on culture? Am I going to be focusing on building up infrastructure? All these sorts of questions. One of the best classical era civilizations, in my opinion, is the Carthaginians. And that's simply due to the fact that they have this Kothon here. Um, and the hard bargainers, which makes all buildable objects 25% cheaper to buy out. But the Kothon is super powerful. First of all, it's a walled fortification. So it has, you know, fortifications on it. So units are more powerful standing on or near it, I believe. Um, it also gives you plus three industry per adjacent coastal water and plus two per lake. It's just, lakes are weaker. It gives you a, a, a worker slot for production and it is basically a harbor. But it also counts as a farmer's quarter, a market quarter and a maker's quarter. So um, the synergy that this district has on the coastline is amazing. So you just like imagine building a harbor is something you can do once per territory. So like if I put a coath on here, it would be for food, right? Because I'm working all these tiles or whatever. Theoretically, it will actually be more food. Um, but let's put it somewhere a little bit more logical, actually. Uh, here, six food. Uh, wait, this is, these are bad examples because I don't have really, I don't have really good coastline actually to show this off. But let's say if I put it here, this would actually be more like, because it would be working all of these once I claimed these islands, it would be more like 12 food. And that it would also be an extra nine production. And this thing would count as a four, farmer's quarter and stuff like that. So I could, you know, 
put other districts adjacent to it and since districts of the same type get bonuses for being adjacent to districts of the same type I could pick up a bunch of extra yields from being able to build a coat on so that's this is the Carthaginians are a choice that I would almost always recommend because they get the war elephant which is a ridiculously powerful unit and all that requires is two copper it doesn't even need horses so if you're low on horses and you have lots of copper Carthage Carthage Cothons, just they're extremely hard, extremely hard to argue with the Carthaginians. And they're also a merchant, which allows them to get access to luxuries they otherwise wouldn't. Um, the Axumites, I think, are... They are good. Um, they are good, especially if you did anything remotely religious in the early game. And that's because they have the Great Obelisk here. The Great Obelisk gives you plus one money per territory under the religion's influence. And that means that this scales... Uh, extremely well. So if I have uh, three cities and they each have three territories, that means I get nine gold per per every single one of these things when I activate the religion screen. Every single thing, one of these that's like fully lit up with my religion, I get nine gold per every one of these. And every territory that I acquire and add another one of those pyramids to, or uh, one of those, uh, what are they called again? The obelisks to, that gets even better. They also have access to Shotelli Warrior, which is an upgraded swordsman who has a very large zone of control. I think these are female warriors if i remember correctly i might be it might be like an age of empires thing um they're also merchants we have the celts uh plus two food do, 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 do. so these guys are very good at growing they have the agrarian things that allows them to siphon off population from other cities uh the nemetan very good so this this scales uh the the larger and more territories your cities has the better this operates so this is quite powerful it also gives you faith counts as a farmer's quarter the gazette is quite a powerful unit because it doesn't require any strategic resources and it's 25 combat strength which is about on par with a classical area unit um and it's available basically straight away you just have to research standing army and you can pump these guys out and they also don't take combat strength penalties from being damaged so very 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 powerful unit for swarming people with um then you got the goths who get plus 10 combat strength when ransacking on their units i believe how this works is if you're choosing to pillage an enemy improvement it actually takes time it doesn't happen instantaneously so you might be sitting there for three turns pillaging and getting plus 10 combat strength when you're ransacking is massive like game-breakingly massive um to the point where uh, to the point where you may not be able to stop them from pillaging, uh, which is kind of cool. They also get the two influence from their garrisons, which is a type of building they can make. Uh, the fortress building that gives you a little bit of stability, so getting influence from that is cool. They have the Tumulus, which is a faith and influence district. Not the most useful and amazing thing, but could be useful. But more importantly, the Goths are militarists, which allows them to uh, have higher war support and call up free units. And then they have the Gothic cavalry. So kind of taking, ra rather than go through every single one of these sieves, hopefully that has given you an idea. Um, in my head right now, from what I know, is I'm kind of going in a Persia direction mentally here. I have a ton of cities. I would like more cities. The... Shadow of Cyrus here gives me two city cap. I plan to go to war with the Mycenaeans, so I'm going to capture more cities. Then we have the Satraps Palace, which gives me influence, money, and influence and stability. So this all this all lines up with what I kind of want to be doing. I feel like it's either the Achaemenid Persians. I don't think it's the Romans because the Triumphal Arch I don't think is super important to me. The army upkeep thing is great though. Looking at the Marians, they're they're okay. The Huns are insane. I would, I really want to do a, um, I really want to do like a, I think it's Akkadians. I can't remember what the, what, I can't remember what the first era nomadic civ is called, but like those guys into Huns, into Mongols, because these guys are insane. So these are basically units. They're like gray goo. The, it's very hard to get the first Hunnic horde out, but once you have a Hunnic horde, oh my god, you run around the map killing things, pillaging things, and killing things and pillaging things makes more Hunnic horde. Now, they cost a lot of money to maintain, but you can get a lot of them very quickly, and they're very hard to stop. Very, very hard to stop. Incredibly powerful unit because of their grey goo, like, sort of amorphous blob properties. But I think we've hemmed and hawed about this enough. I'm going to go ahead and take Cyrus's Shadow. This gives me stability, extra city slots, and access to a relatively good, a, a relatively good unique unit and unique ability and all that sort of stuff. So let's go ahead and confirm that. And next turn, we will advance. We Oh man, our religion upgraded too. 
So we could take, oh man, there's a lot of choices here. Observe fasts would give me extra food for my harbors. I don't think that's necessary on a Pangea map. We could go for a raised monument, which would give me extra stability on my garrisons. This would be very good if I was having trouble with stability and I was building garrisons to deal with it. I don't think I am and I don't think I will do that. I could do give alms, which gives me extra money on market quarters. That's really powerful. Um, bear not false witness gives extra science on research quarters. Well, give alms would actually line up really nicely with the Persians because I believe their unique district counts as a market quarter. So if I picked up give alms, this would actually work really, really well and give me a lot of money. Then there is undertake pilgrimage and reject luxury. I'm, I'm going to go for give alms because it works really well with what we're going to be doing in the next era. So I'll, I'll prioritize that. We'll, we'll go for give alms. A new tenant for Pharaoh worship. People are buying my resources. Let's put this city under siege now that we have the room for it. Uh, we'll go ahead and assault. We'll just do an instant resolve. We might lose a unit or two. It's not that big of a deal. And now we control this city. And next turn, uh, we will have an overflow event. All right, we found the archers, the chariots in position to take these guys on. Initiate combat and instantly resolve. Boom. And oh wow, that actually got me a militarist star, a gold militarist star as well before I finish this era. Insane. So I think now it's pretty reasonable to spend a bit of time working on like things like my wonders uh, and stuff like that. I'm in a relatively stable position. Nobody's really threatening me. So I'm going to put a little bit of time into my shrines and my wonders and stuff like that. And uh, we're going to be greeted with another movie, but I'm going to skip it again. I want you guys to watch those when you play the game yourself. Uh, they're wonderful, they're amazing, super, super worth worth watching. You can see our civilization's look and feel is starting to change. And we just picked up writing, which gives us access to the market quarter. It looks like a small graphical glitch there, uh, which also gives us the food market and the house of scribes and access to laws. So the market quarter is a district that allows you to make money, basically. It, it gains more money if you build it adjacent to a luxury resource like this incense over here. It's also gains more money if it's built adjacent to other market quarters. And we've got the food market here, which allows market quarters to make more money. And then the um, House of Scribes, which gives us extra science from our researchers. I think now that I'm reaching a point of stability in here, I'm going to spend a very small amount of money to finish this. I'm, I'm going to switch this city over to a more balanced policy so that I'm kind of pulling in a little bit of every resource. I think a big focus for me now in the very early stages of this era is actually going to be about making this city grow much more population because I have a maximum population of 24. So if I pump a little bit of time into things like animal barns, which will get me 15 food plus extra food for my farmer's quarters. Um, if I get a granary, which will give me extra food for my farmers and the flood irrigation, if I spend just a little bit of time working on that food, it'll pay dividends in, in form of population over the rest of the game quite well. And then I'm also going to pick up, a, I, I, I'm also going to pick up the public fountain for the extra 15 stability because the stability in the city is getting a little bit low. So we're going to just spend a little bit of time powering up this city. All right, let's also take over a card here. Should be a fairly simple uh, assault and instant resolve. Shouldn't lose any units. And now I have managed to take over this entire middle section of the map, essentially, well, at little to no cost to myself. All right, let's go ahead and pop down the five food, 10 production outpost in this spot. Ah, it's not a valid territory, unfortunate. Let's go ahead and drop an outpost on this river as well. Jesus, um, two and 23 production. That is a lot, but I think I'd rather, um, I'd rather settle on the river and get like six and 10 production because it's a little bit more balanced. But yeah, let's immediately begin on philosophy so we can get another city slot. And now we'll start having to think about when and where we want to declare war on the Mycenaeans. Looks like he's actually trespassing on my borders. So I wonder if I can make a grievance demand. Ah, so because I'm the Akinamid Persians, I can always trespass. Tag another empire's outpost or administer center. Ooh, I'm interested actually. Does that mean I can just go be a massive land stealing jerk as the Persians? Let's give it a try actually. Let's see if we can like put pressure on this guy without actually declaring war. I kind of want to explore that possibility. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to get this shrine built. We're going to get the wonder built. Get stability restored to my capital. And these scouts can finally head back to my capital to actually get disbanded and turned into population working inside my capital. Because I've claimed all of the land that I need to claim over here. And I have a sizable enough army that I can use them to claim land from now on. And I'm actually quite happy with my gold income here. 120 gold per turn is very, very juicy. Wow. 
Militarist stars from killing things already. I need quite a few things. I think the big thing here is going to be expansionist based. I would like to at least trigger bronze and silver here by expanding my city. So influence is going to be a big part of that. And in fact, I can start, I can already start sort of expanding this. Um, I need to kind of plan out what I, what I'm going to do. I think maybe a CAD will take Copernicus and Kaolasi. So I'll do that. I'll take Copernicus with a CAD. With Haranica, I'd rather take like Deneb and Gobi. And with Thebes, I'll take Felis because that kind of just works better with the way the city is set up. And I'm also going to send these guys a little bit of money and a little bit of influence so I can maybe look into assimilating them later. So he's finished building a small military over here. Let's continue to help with the Great Temple. I want those shrines finished. Um, the wisdom of others. Cool. So now we have the option to enact knowledge authorities. Elder wisdom will give me extra science per researcher on city or outpost, or I can get plus one science per um, trade route on city or outpost. And I'm doing a lot of trading right now. I'm picking up 112.3 science per turn and, and I'm doing a lot of trading. So I think, I think this might actually be worth a lot of science. So if I enact that and go check this now, 140 science per turn now. So that was actually a massive upgrade for me. I do kind of wish there is a part of me that kind of wish I was told like how much this is going to affect my civilization. But there also is an argument to be made for things to be fuzzy and hard to hard to know because then part of the skill becomes like, how, how do you feel this is going to work? And Sometimes it's okay to encourage players to not make optimal decisions because you want the player to play the game, right? And you don't want them to play an optimization puzzle where they're always trying to make the best decision. Sometimes part of playing a game is actually not making, is making decisions that aren't the best. It's making a decision that's, you know, not necessarily bad, but not necessarily the maximized best decision that you could do in that exact moment. Also, there's a lot of pop-ups that happen down here at the bottom of the screen, which I haven't been talking about. A lot of them have to do with people like buying my resources, uh, sort of other uh, world deeds being completed. And then like most of it is actually just population gains, which are not super worth them. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and buy the Ambergris, which is basically whales, because it's worth five science per city. And it'll also give me more trade routes. Otherwise, I don't think I have the money to buy a lot of these things. Let's delete this scout. As cool as he is, and as, as much as I like him, he's going to join the population in Memphis, as is this scout over here. So I can bring the population up here immediately to 10. And now we're working a much more balanced, taking a much more balanced view of this city. I really like the balanced policy after a certain amount of time. It means that you don't neglect any particular thing. Like if I put the city on city growth, I'm only getting food and production from this city. Sure, that's cool and all. Um, also, interestingly here, I'll pull all my population out of food and you can see I'm growing 29% per turn. If I add those five farmers back in, I'm actually growing 50% per turn. So a little bit of extra food goes a long way. Um, and then if I take away some of them, I go down to 39%. But I find having like a balanced economy can actually give you a lot of flexibility. I would say more advanced players, as they get better at the game, they're going to want to specialize a little bit more. But just keep in mind that specialization in this game carries with it some very very big and inherent risks we just got an agrarian star which is very exciting i need another 17 population we've unlocked philosophy which gives us access to the research quarter and the school as well as an extra erudite administrator which is plus one city cap the research quarter is interesting because it gives you a ton of research and um, most importantly the research job but also the school is quite valuable because it makes your existing research quarters quite a bit more valuable i don't typically tend to build research quarters early they're a pretty hefty investment when there are other ways to get science but they can be worth it if you picked a sieve in like the previous era or this era that builds a quarter that has a scientific tag on it so you can get the extra science out of it i tend to like to get my science from other avenues we're doing a little bit of exploring very nice it's tech time so let's explore some of the classical era technologies that we have available to us we've got hydrology which will give us industry and food on rivers as well as extra stability well i have a lot of river-based cities so that might be useful to grab levy administration would give me extra money on my main plazas but i believe that also lead to a better 
Levy administration later on here somewhere. Don't remember where it is. It would be nice to unlock the commons quarter because that opens up options for increasing my stability by using my infrastructure. Um, customs farm seems quite good too. Also, maybe my unique unit is a good idea to unlock iron and get my unique unit. So maybe we'll uh, progress towards standing army as a priority. Ha! <laughs> Are you sus? I'm expecting Morbius to like insert the Among Us boom. Like noise as the meeting is called or whatever. Ooh, some deer. Let's kill the deer. Uh, this is a deer free land. Thank you. No deer allowed. So it looks like we actually finished the shrine that we were building over here. I think this was it. Yeah, that was it. And uh, now I'm going to start putting production into the Temple of Artemis because I want to get that finished too. We could choose between a solar calendar and a lunar calendar. So this doesn't actually really have consequences outside of RP and your ideology. So if I moved more towards a um, progress lens, oops, misclicked. If I moved more towards a progress lens, uh, that'll kind of cement the progress ideology in my civilization. And if I move more towards a lunar uh, end of things, that kind of goes more traditional. It would slightly lower my science, slightly increase my stability. I'm going to go with solar just to keep my um, my things nice and tight with the uh, scientific end of the spectrum. So we've unlocked iron and the city watch and the immortal, which is our unique unit. And we absolutely want to be getting the immortal. And the cool thing about the immortal is that it is a, a classical era unique unit o only requires copper, right? Um, normally, if you want a unit remotely as strong as uh as this, you need iron, but that's the power of the immortal. So I think if I go through to a lot of my units here, you can see here my warriors are now upgradable um, to swordsmen. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. Which one is, is it spearmen that upgrade? Ah, it's spearmen that upgrade to the immortal. Sorry. So yeah, now I can upgrade two of my spearmen to immortals. And these guys just became like ridiculously powerful. 30 combat strength, 20 health regeneration, blah, 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 blah extra combat strength when they're fighting from high positions these immortals are insane just by the way um in case no one told you immortals are insane i can one turn a lot of these technologies which i may do in order to pick up some scientist stars here so i'll just start like popping out these like really cheap techs and just get them done my science right now is is, is very very strong so it cost me 500 gold to annex this and I'm going to make the attempt. I'm going to make the attempt to annex this with my units. So I'll grab these guys. I'll tell them to come here. I will, so like, target another empire's outpost or administrative trender. Uh, it'll take the army a few turns, kind of trigger, I need to wait a few turns after successful. So I can basically steal land. After six turns, this land will be mine. Our religion has advanced again. We just have such a strong faith gain with the polytheism here that our religion is essentially unstoppable and it's completely engulfing the world, especially because this is a small world. And again, remember, I recommend you play on a small world when you're a new player because it means less complexity. It means um, you, once you overcome the enemies, you have all the time in the world to explore all the late game and mid game mechanics to your own, you know, to your own ends. Uh, so we could develop our intellect, which would give us science for alliances. We could get extra movement on our units. We could get extra production from our cities. We could get extra war support extra money per number of trade routes that seems very good or we could be charitable i like mandate patronage here is kind of cool my religion is giving me lots of gold and science so i feel like it might be good to get something else um this does nothing for me this does nothing for me so it's really between production and gold and this gold seems really really good uh so i'm going to grab the gold instead it should actually give us a decent amount of gold especially because i could in theory come in here and uh go ahead and buy more stuff off people in particular the harappans have more stuff to sell me i think what do you mean i can't afford it all right i guess i need to save more money stability in my capital has hit on new high um we're consuming a lot of food in here and I would like to address that. Question is, do I want this to be a food or do I want this to be a production river? Well, that's a hard call to make. Let's go over to Hurricana because I want to attach a new territory to it because that should, in theory, have triggered a territory star. Oh, not quite. I need another one. Well, let's come over to Hagmatana and yoink. Uh, actually, with Thebes, I will yoink Homam. Boom. There's the expansion of star I was looking for. Two more gets me silver. Um, it's going to be a priority. Is linking up all our territory. But now my empire is starting to fill out. In my capital, it is hard to know what to do here. Like I was saying, I need more food. 
I think, you know what, I can one turn a lot of this infrastructure here. So rather than building up my uh, capital cities districts, I'm going to spend a little bit of time like one turning all of these um, important pieces of infrastructure, like the forge, which gives me extra production for every copper I have. Uh, the lumber yard, which gives me extra production for every tree in the city. And then the um, stoneworks, which gives me extra production for every uh, mountain, stone field, and rocky field. So this will just maximize the production in the city for a little bit. And then we can kind of come back and look at the city with fresh eyes and maybe make some decisions about it. So I'm just trying to build up my capital to be a super uh, place. And then these peripheral cities are going to take care of my needs. I, I want a really, really big and really, really powerful capital. It's kind of like a satisfying way that I find to play. We just researched fortifications. So my units are now stronger inside cities and we have access to stone walls as well as citizens, which are an upgrade to our levy troops that appear to defend your city automatically. And we picked up a scientist star, which is awesome. We also finished the Temple of Artemis, which if you don't remember, gave us extra regeneration on our units as well as a bunch of stability, faith, and all that kind of jazz. I don't know if I've actually seen any iron. Ah, there's iron here in Kalausi. I'm going to prioritize and get that iron online. With that iron improved, we should be able to come out and actually upgrade these guys over here to swordsmen. That will eat into my coffers a little bit because I'm now paying for these more expensive units. But it also makes my army much more scary, which means the AI is less likely to mess with me and more likely to acquiesce to my demands. Talking about developing my cities, I've got all my sort of important main things built, like my shrines, my wonders. Um, and now it's really just down to like, how do I want to develop Thebes? I think we're going to go ahead and switch over to a balanced policy here as well, so that we get a nice mixture of every resource and then start building up this city. It would be really, really cool if I could throw down some satraps palaces especially near these luxury resources. Those are worth 13 gold per. Um, but it might actually be worth it for me to do the same thing I did in my capital and just build up a little bit of a food income so this city can grow population a little bit faster and fill out these jobs. Or maybe actually it might even be worth it for me to prioritize the forge in a lot of my cities. This is like 30 production at least across my empire. So 30 production for three turns of, of construction is absolutely worth it. So I'm going to go for the forge pretty much everywhere it makes sense. And uh, because of the value I get from it, it makes sense everywhere. But I will pick up the pottery workshop first because influence is king. Or maybe maybe kings have influence. We can also grab ourselves a new wonder if we want, but I think my priority is to link up my territory. Just out of curiosity, which wonders are available here? So it looks like the mausoleum at Halicarnassus has already been taken, which gives you a 1% science boost per district or on city or an outpost. So that's pretty powerful if you're going to build a tall empire. That's very, very good. And I believe... No. It doesn't count as a holy site. We also have the statue of Zeus, which is a stability and gold improvement that also acts as a holy site, so it's worth a lot of faith. It will give you extra gold per alliance on your empire, as well as stability per city. Very, very powerful. The Lighthouse of Alexandria will give you stability, extra vision range, and I believe it'll also give your naval units a little bit of an edge. That's quite powerful. The Colossus of Rhodes makes it impossible to siege down your cities. Normally when you're sieging a city, you will slowly lose defending units. Um, like your militia, but with the Colossus of Rhodes, those guys will not die. I kind of like the idea of either... I, th I think I like the idea of Statue of Zeus here. So I could claim it. I'm not going to because, again, my priority is actually expanding my current existing cities. I think Memphis is going to eat these two territories eventually. But for now, Haranica is going to eat Gobi, maybe. Or actually, no, it's going to eat Zeus, and then my capital is going to eat Gobi. So Akkad instead, you're going to eat Kalausi, Bush. Is another territory for you. And then Hagmatana, you might eat this territory over here that I'm I'm kind of claiming. I'll have a cad be a nice big fat city in the center of my empire. I don't know. We're kind of exploring ideas. We're 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 not I'm not sure how I'm gonna develop, but I'm I'm making decisions. Ah, we're under attack. Did they declare war on me? Interesting. So they have declared war on me. I could retreat here. They have reinforcements, they have spearmen and the Promachoi which have a big combat bonus on the first turn. I have relatively weak units, so I'm actually going to retreat here. And this will give me a turn to get some reinforcements into that battle. Now, this is objectively a worse position for me, especially if he attacks from this high ground. But I do have relatively okay terrain around to protect myself. And I might be able to scooch these guys. Ah, nice. So he actually started the battle here um, where I have actually a pretty big advantage. He's only bringing a single swordsman to the fight. So I'll just fight this real quick. Ah, I didn't expect him to do... I didn't expect the battle AI to scream me like this because I just quickly tried to resolve it, but... Um, we'll do this quickly. 
Rear attack plus charge. Rear attack plus charge. Should be easy kills. And that's the battle. Yoink. Free unit, and I can upgrade my religion again. Because remember, my religion is so powerful right now that the entire world is rapidly converting due to this the, the, the raw faith generation that I'm able to create here. Like you can see, see these numbers? Like let's say I click on my capital. This faith gain that's happening over here is like putting pressure. You can see like the noodles. This is the pressure that it's exerting or having exerted upon it. And if I click on someone else's religion, you can see their numbers are just way lower, like 30, 13, da, da, da. And then this spot right here is being massively influenced by all of my cities from various directions. Um, so this is the final tier of upgrade for my my religion. And I can choose a, you can, at, at every tier, you can choose a different look for your religious sites, by the way. I can go for Beware False Prophets, which will give me 50 sites for every cultural wonder I have. I can go for Proselytize Daily, which gives me stability on territories if territories follow a foreign religion. I'm not sure how this works. I'd like to figure out how this works. We have Donate Generously, which gives me money for every alliance I have, as well as three maximum holy sites, which is quite powerful, getting those three extra holy sites. And then uh, Meditate Often, which gives me extra combat strength on my units. And I think to round this out, I'm going to go for Meditate Often. Plus two combat strength is rare and difficult and very powerful. So we'll take that tenet and we'll stick with Pharaoh Worship. And now we have a fully completed religion. Tier four religion, completely built up. Um, and these are all of our beliefs. Science, money, money, and combat. It kind of reflects quite well here. Um, but I'm very happy with my religion in this game. Let's make a law decision, maybe. Cheaper religious districts. Plus five influence if territories follow state religion. Let's do that. that well and, good. and I think, yeah, I think that just gave me a lot of influence. I could be wrong, though. The Akinimit Persians. Okay, cool. That was us doing that. I don't know why the game gave me a pop-up about something that I did. They like interrupted this by attacking me, which is annoying. All right, cool. We're up to a surplus of 278 industry in here. I reckon more food would be good. We have plenty of stability to spend because we built things like wonders and great temples, which give you stability. My satrap's palace is also a really cool build, but I think the food thing is, uh, is big here. It's the, it's the thing I have the least surplus of, and the more surplus you have of food, the faster your population grows. And I don't really have much in the way of, of these to build, like my infrastructures. We've unlocked sailing, which gives us access to the fishmonger, which gives us money on our harbors, as well as the pentaconter, which is a coastal ship that can explore a little bit of the water. We also got hydrology, which gives us food on rivers, which is an upgrade of that building, and the water mill, which also gives us industry on rivers, and then the aqueduct, which gives us more stability. So lots of really, really cool infrastructure we've unlocked this turn. It might not be a bad idea to go for the charcoal kiln. Artisan workshop also seems quite good. Um, ooh, 10% cheaper attach outposts seems quite good for me too, as well as having the ballista as a siege weapon option could be nice. Relocate capital. Being able to unlock the quadri beam seems quite good. I think I'm going to go for the library and the school. The theater will give me influence. The library will give me extra science on my population. And then the holy day potentially could be a way for me to generate extra faith if I so choose. So let's position my army around because I'm basically quote unquote at war with this guy but not at war with him i'm trying to steal his land to make my ability work for me i need to attach one more territory to get this kill three more units research a technology and grow three more pop all right things are looking great then Ooh, religious minorities so plus 10 money on territories if territories follow a foreign religion this is like the gz attacks i think it gives you money if an enemy religion has taken over your civilization or untaxed minority which gives you stability interesting not sure I care or want those things to happen for me. Nice, we built the forge. I do wish that it would show you specifically. Here it is, yeah. 30 industry is coming from the forge. So the forge is super powerful here. Very powerful, very useful, very happy with it. Um, this city doesn't have a massive stability problem right now, but I will go ahead and get the public fountain to increase the stability. I like a very highly stable empire. I used to play very, very low on stability, but now I like playing high stability. This is like a style thing. You'll figure it out as you test mechanics and you try out things. I just, I don't know, I enjoy the game more when I have high stability. Nice, we got a builder star. Need another 10 districts to get the next one. I wish there was a way to like 
right click and tell the game or middle click or something and tell the game I don't want to build a farmer's quarter here and then get another suggestion from it because as it stands I kind of have to like go through and be like okay where do I want to build this which isn't like the end of the world it's just like slightly annoying another agrarian star for me three turns until I steal this piece of territory using the expansionist ability I'm curious to see how it works I've never done it before uh, these guys need to be upgraded actually uh can I sneak them out to my territory Maybe, maybe I can sneak him out. So I think Hagmatana, almost all of its terrain, except for the rivers, produces production. And then there's like a small plain over here where you can get, get some food, right? Just 11 food, like right there. I think this city's going to have to rely heavily on harbors for food and growth. So I think that's what we're going to do is we're going to dedicate uh, a, a significant amount of this city's time over the next, like, you know, this era or whatever to just getting the uh, the two, maybe three harbors that it needs and then building up a naval infrastructure because this is a primarily a coastal city. But I am going to pick up things like the industry on river, the water mill, lumber yards, stone works, build up this city's you know production and food income before I push hard on the harbors with the basic infrastructure because the basic infrastructure helps you scale really, really well. So we have unlocked rhetoric, which gives us the theater square and the library, which are two buildings that I'm excited about. And we got a scientist star. We just need three more techs and we hit the gold scientist star. Uh, if we grow another few people, we will hit another population star. Man, we are just hitting stars this era, and it, it is it is a feel feeling pretty good for me right now. I'm gonna go ahead and take Menkar inside of my capital. Boosh. That'll give me an expansionist star. I need to claim another two territories to hit the next expansionist star, which I think I can do before I'm finished with this era. I mean, I'm 10 turns into this era and I'm already ready to advance to the next culture, which is something you could do. You can rush through the cultures if you want. Like, arguably, everything I want from the Akinamid Persians, I've already gotten. I have the extra cities. I didn't really need to build their district, but I, I will spend a little bit more time in here to build their districts and stuff like that. Another battle down here should be a straightforward one. If I manually fight it, let's make sure that our ranged units are in the back, actually. Like that. So all my ranged units are in the back. We'll end our deployment. Got a lot of really powerful units actually coming at me. Not a huge fan. However, they are taking pretty hefty damage. I will lose a chariot, which sucks. It's okay, that's part of life. Sometimes you lose a chariot. We have the advantage of having immortals on the flank here to come join us. Let's bring in the ranged unit first. Sneak our way on over and take a shot. And then we'll, we'll, we'll start bringing in the immortals to act as flankers and maneuverers. Using the immortals, we should be able to get a kill right there. Using our archers, we should be able to get a kill right there. This swordsman should die in theory. If I fall back and throw another attack at him, boom, you come over here, get that kill. We'll bring this chariot into the fight. I don't like that you're pretty low on health, so I'm going to retreat you and instead step this guy up into that position and get that kill. We'll attack downhill into the spearman. You want to, it's like, it's just a lot of manipulation, right? There's some very, very simple mechanics here. Attack downhill, attack units standing on rivers, um, avoid... Um, being on disadvantaged terrain. This is like some very, 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 very basic rules that if you follow, you'll win most of your fights. All right, let's see how they respond now that I've, I've brought a bunch of extra units into this battle. Ah, they're trying. Oh, they actually killed another chariot. Well, I mean, taking losses is kind of expected at this point. These armies are relatively large. You know, they're trading, I would say trading down. Because they killed a few units, but I'm obviously going to kill a lot more of theirs than they killed of mine. Just getting all my ranged attacks off. And then I think that's the last guy right here. Yeah, let's get him killed. Boom, he's dead. So that, that should be a militarist star right there, I think. Killing all those units. That's like a solid seven, seven units I killed. Oh, there's a unit still alive. Who has an attack? Chariot, go kill him. Boom, now he's dead. We killed seven units. Boom, there's a militarist star. Five more units and we get a gold military star. Awesome. Just annoying that this interrupts this and restarts the process. I'd probably be better off just declaring war now at this point, but I would I would need reinforcements here. I would need to like reorganize my army and bring in reinforcements, but I'm going to call that the end of this episode. We made significant progress. Our empire is looking extremely powerful. And my hope is that you've you've learned a little bit about the game, like how how I play, how I think, what I do and why I do it. I love you all very much. 
and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.